Hey everyone, welcome uh, to this week's webinar, uh, continuing to discuss uh, profiting on the recovery. Uh, and uh, last week uh, I was motivated when, when I used the line, um, look where the puck is going, not where the puck is. And I used that last week. Now I, I couldn't use that in good conscience without reaching out to my good friend, Ryan Rabinovich, who is the president of PSR, uh, their new sales division, uh, because he is the one that used that line recently and I borrowed it from him. Um, and I thought it was, was an incredible uh, quote to use to reference what is going on in the Toronto real estate industry. So we've talked about profiting on the recovery. You can do the short term. Short term, you're gonna profit on the recovery. Uh, you're gonna get jump into the resale market and you're gonna you're gonna look at profiting uh, you know, I'd say a hundred thousand dollars depending on the product over uh, 18 months into 2022. But again, with that comes your rent is not gonna be good. Uh, you, you may have some vacancies, some, some costs with that. Um, dealing with the mortgages and everything, you just may not want the hassle of dealing with what's going on right now in the current market. But by taking on that risk, you will profit 100%. The other option is looking where the puck is going and where the opportunity in that is. Um, so we're gonna take you on a little journey and talking about focusing more on the buy long side uh, and Ryan is also going to provide insight. Now he's he's a, a developer representative. He's he can also talk about how costs are actually going up for build for builders. So so new product is not going to go down in price. It's only going to go up. We hear this time and time again from all our developer partners. So Ryan will provide some more insight into that. Now when we talk about where the puck is going, obviously downtown is downtown. Now downtown pre-construction pricing is still expensive. And as I said, pricing with, within the downtown core is going to continue to go up. The last Toronto area that both myself and Kyle invested in, so this is Toronto with, if I'm getting my driver's license, my driver's license will say Toronto. The last Toronto area we both invested in um, was in the Central West area, which is the Galleria development. We've talked about it a number of times. So I like using the word Central West to describe this neighborhood because we're still central in the city, but we're just west off of, uh, let's say if we're looking Yorkville, why, uh, Yorkville area. So we're central and, and we're west. So we're looking at where development is going in the future. So when I look at that whole area, there are significant changes that are going on. So, you know, we've done many, many videos on Galleria, and we'll touch a little more on that, that at the end of this video. Um, you can watch our other videos on those. But another development that was going up in the area, and I guess it is still going up in the area, but to provide some people some information on this. So Bloor Dufferin, which is also a master plan community, which is, which is a large site, six buildings going up on the southwest corner. That building, if you don't know, you may not, is now no longer gonna be condos. So the builders that were involved in that development, capital developments in Metropia, were bought out by Timber Creek. Now Timber Creek is a purpose-built rental building owner. So you're now going to see no longer, you're not gonna see condos in that site, you're gonna have six rental buildings going up in that location, purpose-built rental buildings. Now why that's key. I've mentioned this in other videos when we look at different locations. Timber Creek has more employees than I do. Timber Creek is worth billions of dollars. Timber Creek has analysts. That means they analyze this area. That means they're like, well, it makes sense for us to buy this development site and put and invest and put um, buildings here and then rent all these buildings out. So these this company, which has... Tons of analysts said, hey, make this very uh, large investment in this site and invest hundreds of millions of dollars to build buildings here and keep it. So that, isn't that, let's follow those people, the people that actually have 
the hundreds of millions of dollars to invest, they're doing that. And, and it's not just them. So if we continue on, Bluer Dufferin, no longer condos going there, moving down the road. Th this was just recently, and I, did, I had no idea about this. Kyle forwarded me an email about a public consultation. So Kyle, I'll let you get more, more into what's happening at Bluer and Lansdowne. Yeah, and there's actually a large value village site that's on that site, just a little bit west along Bloor. Um, and it actually sides against uh, the rail tracks that are there. And that's the Barry Go train um, line right now that is still in operation. So th they're going to be completely redeveloping or planning to redevelop that site. And it's actually quite far along. There are actually extensive uh, plans already in place. And this was the start of the community consultation as part of the development process that was happening. And they're looking to develop two condo towers there, as well as a lot of retail, some that's going to front along Blur Street and help integrate the entire um, streetscape into the development itself. Um, so it was actually kind of a surprise you know, how far along they got and how much development is actually going to be there. But one of the best parts is that they're going to be putting a GO train station at that site at Bloor and Lansdowne, which means people in that area in the community are going to be able to easily get downtown using that GO train station, maybe in 10 to 15 minutes versus the 20 to 30 minutes it would take you uh, if you were going to take TTC and having to transfer down onto the Young University line. 20, 30 minutes, you're, you're, you're being generous. <laughs> That's 30, 30 There's no walking time either. To That's get on the subway the station. <laughs> uh, but, but, all, but also, I'll, I want to correct Kyle on one thing. It, it's not confirmed to be condos. So the developer, King set, set doing that development, doesn't, doesn't have a history. Sorry, yeah, two towers. Yeah, two towers. It doesn't have a history of doing um, condo buildings. There's a good chance that those will be, per they'll partner with Bentall and do purpose built rentals on that site as well. So now we have prime real estate. Again, we're talking about companies investing hundreds of millions of dollars and keeping these locations and doing purpose-built rentals. And speaking about purpose-built rentals, if I continue going down and now I get to Bloor and, uh, and Dundas. So I'm, I'm, I've just hit these, these, these subway stops. It goes Dufferin, it goes Lansdowne, it goes Dundas Station on the Bloor line. So Dundas Station, there's currently a purpose-built rental tower being built there right now. It's under, it's under construction, drive by the intersection every day. It's a 10 minute walk from my house. Purpose-built rental under construction. And then that's on the northeast side. On the northwest side, which was a former condo development called Giraffe Condos, that there has been purchased and a new rental tower is being proposed for that site. So again, another purpose-built rental tower. So now we have, how many buildings we at? We're at six, eight, that's nine, 10, including the one that's under construction. That's 10 buildings, potential to be zero condos, all purpose-built rentals. I'm sure if you did the math, it's over a billion dollars worth of development right there, dollars-wise. None of it is going to be condos, zero. Don't, uh, don't you, so sorry, recently, you know, Brad J. Lamb uh, made a purchase of land um, right at Bloor and Symington. Bloor and Symington, you may not know that um, intersection. It's right, right beside Lansdowne. Also, uh, a small condo tower going there. So we're seeing massive investments happening along the Central West location. Again, oh, potentially over a billion dollars invested. People looking what's going to be happening in this area along this stretch from Dufferin all the way to Dundas. And then even on Dundas, there is the crown jewel of development um, in regards to the choice property site. So what the choice property, uh, that's, that's the REIT of Loblaws. Um, there's a Loblaws currently in, the, in that location, LCBO in that location, there used to be a Zellers. It's a massive site. That one there is uh, in the talks, of, not talks, it will be redeveloped. There, there's also a, there's already a, community consultation building in the old Zellers uh, location, just bringing the, community, bringing the community input in. And they're gonna be doing retail, uh, office, and residential uh, in that location. And I can tell you, it won't all be condos. Uh, they'll hold back some of that for some purpose-built rental uh, as well. So if we're looking at what's happening in five to 10 years, in this area, we have significant concentration being built up in this area, which makes sense with the public transit connectivity. 
Um, Kyle brought up that you have this new station going up at Bloor and Lansdowne that will get you to the downtown core in 10 to 15 minutes on, on the GO train line, on the Barry GO train line. Already the Bloor and Dundas location outside of Union Station, it is the next most connected intersection for public transit in the city of Toronto with having UP, Expr uh, UP Express, GO train line, subway, streetcar, buses right in that location. And part of the, uh, the current um, purpose-built development that's happening in that location, they're building a tunnel which is going to connect the subway station to the GO train and UP Express station underground, improving the connectivity, making that a central west hub for transit in the city. And that, that hub there is on your KW uh, GO train line. And we all know what happens in KW in regards to um, technology jobs. So now if you're looking at a corridor and a potential for a technology hub, let's say on the uh, Dundas and Bloor uh, development side of the choice properties, this is where you're going to be seeing uh, things happening along this Bloor development, which if you compare the potential for the Bloor line development with what's happened on Young Line, Bloor is the real next frontier for public uh, transit uh, locations. Now, bringing that full circle, bringing Ryan back in, he represents Galleria, um, which is an eight tower master plan community going up between Dufferin and Lansdowne subway stations, uh, only a 10 minute walk to either of those. And now it now uh, roughly a, a 10 minute walk to the future proposed um, Metrolink station, which is gonna get you downtown in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, that's actually gonna be a condo site. So all those developments, excluding let's say the Brad J. Lamb site, all those developments will most likely not, you won't be able to invest in those. It's, it's gonna be all pension fund money that, that's investing in, in all these sites. Pension fund money and wealthy families are gonna, are gonna own all the real estate along, along Bloor. So where's your opportunity to, to take advantage of this future investment, gentrification, uh, development along Bloor? Um, Galleria is, is, is really gonna be the, the only space to do that. And it's its own master plan community in that. Um, now- And this also ties into the whole notion that we've been talking about for weeks is that even though people believe there's a downside risk to the central core. That's not the case because you have properties like this that are gonna throw the economy back on its trajectory to the, it's been on for the last 20 years. So th this is you where know everything continues. Amit, the, the, uh, let, let's, let, let's talk about that. So, you know, we, we talk about central core, which is, which is downtown. Um, Ryan had a great slide in the presentation he gave to us about a month ago, um, comparing central core to, uh, the central west area. Ryan, why don't you just briefly talk about what's going on in central west uh, during the pandemic wise, what, what we've seen in the retail market and what we saw in the rental market. So first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to be on. And just before I talk about that, uh, I did want to just pose a question and I'm not seeking an answer. I'm just, it's a point of reflection really. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that when we hear in the media that you know, the real estate market may be soft or whatever the case may be. The rental market isn't what it was a year ago. Isn't it interesting that the most influential, wealthiest REITs are actually headed exactly in that direction where the media yells fire, all of the REITs are going and putting their money into uh, purpose-built developments. Oh, yeah. The rentals. Yeah. I think it comes down to the short-term site versus long-term, right? And that's the casual investor looks at it quarter to quarter, and these are multi-billion dollar families and REITs that are looking at it for next generation. It's a completely that's different angle. I agree with you. That's precisely it. And, and, and the point is that as, as a standalone investor, you don't have the ability to, to, you know, for the most part, you don't have the ability to buy a site and decide to develop a rental building on it. Uh, but what you can do is you have the same option that the REITs do. The REITs right now could buy existing apartment buildings if they can be found, uh, but they don't necessarily want to do that based on where the rental market is today. They do believe in the rental market in the medium to long term. So what they're doing is they're, they're building up their pipeline for five, seven, 10 years from now. 
when you buy in a pre-construction development as a standalone investor, you're actually using the same principle. You're putting down capital today to show that you're actually bullish on the Toronto real estate market, both rental and resale in five, seven, 10 years from now, right? You don't necessarily want to buy a resale unit today and put it on the rental market because then you're tied into, you know, lower than typical market rents. Uh, you may see some vacancy and most, most investors don't want to do that. And what you could do uh, as a standalone investor is buy in a site like Galleria, for example, or any other site that, you know, Alex and, and Kyle have um, done their homework on and, and thought it is, you know, is a good investment. You could buy a unit there and then literally forget about it for five to six years until it's ready. And then when it's ready, guess what? Six years in, in a market like Toronto is an eternity and the market will pick back up and, you know, we'll recover and we're going to see that same growth. And essentially you're using the same strategy that billion dollar REITs are using just on your own scale. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to put that out there. Oh, it, it, and it flows into our message. We, we had that great video calling build your own pension fund. That's what you're doing. If yeah. the, the REITs are, are backed by pension funds, pension funds, put their money, money in the REITs. You can build your own by putting a portfolio of 10 units together. You know, that becomes right. a pension right. fund. Um, sign sure. up for that video. Uh, it's one of our most powerful videos that we've done. Um, but yeah, that's exactly on a small scale. You, you, you go to where the opportunity is, um, looking, looking at the, the projections out. And, and one thing that Central West has to offer is there's a good chance that, that these will be cash flow positive in five to six years. When you get into more blue chip sites, let's say along Young Street, I, I'll tell you, you won't, you won't be you won't be cash flow positive. I have no issue with you in, in regards to investing on Young Street, but to be cash flow positive, you're going to have to put more than the typical 20% down. You're just, you're just, it's not going to happen where the pricing is going to be. Um, Central is where the puck is going, where the development isn't here yet. If you, if you, if you still go to Bloor and Dufferin, you know, they're, they're, if you go to Bloor and Lansdowne, you go to Bloor and Lansdowne and look at the retail of Bloor and Lansdowne it is, you know, garbage <laughs> for, for lack for lack of a, a better the coffee time is gone now alex <laughs> yeah 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 but but well but you look dark at horse, it, dark horse value anywhere. village to 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 gentrify the area that that's what's happening in in that area yeah uh, so, so i want to i want to alex sorry to interrupt but i want to yeah. loop back into your original question that you asked mm -hmm. me which is what yep. is going on at, at the center at, at central west in comparison mm -hmm. to the central core and and in in, in tying it all together we've actually spent a lot of time researching just as, as you guys have, uh, how does the value proposition from an investment perspective stack up to the central core? Because many investors, uh, even very sophisticated investors, they like to buy where they see a high level of activity now. And sometimes uh, I would almost be you know, obliged to say usually the best investment and the same returns are just outside of that box. If you have the foresight to think just a little bit outside the box, I'm not talking about, you know, invest in Thunder Bay condos, because that's probably not going to make sense. But if you can think just a little bit outside the box, follow development, follow REITs, see where land transactions are happening, you know, kind of below the radar. Um, and I know you guys follow that closely. If you can understand where those pockets are, you could actually not only build yourself that pension fund by accumulating 10 properties, but you could actually build a lot of value in that fund by buying really smart. And so yeah. what we've done is we've, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time researching and, and understanding how different, different pockets are performing. Uh, and we really wanted to research it during kind of COVID, you know, we're going through closures and, you know, people working from home and not a lot of activity. And we wanted to understand how do, how do sub-markets in the city react? Now, to be clear, when you're talking about Galleria, as an example, you're not talking about a location in Milton. You're talking about a location that's seven, 10 minute drive out of the central core. Um, we're literally right there. We're on transit. You're, connect, you're really well connected to a few different transit options. Um, and you're really right there. And so... We've looked at different pockets and we found that if you take, you know, the central core locations, take like Church and Jar Jarvis, we spent some time researching that. If you look at available units uh, right now for resale, 
uh, condos at Church and Jarvis, you're going to find that there's more than 400 resale options available right now in that intersection within, within a kilometer around that intersection. If you're, if you're a landlord and you're looking to rent your unit, you're going to be competing right now with over 1,700 units seeking tenants. Just yep. think about that number. Think about that number. You're literally competing with 1,700 other landlords looking for the same tenants. So what do you think that's going to do to pricing? That's obviously going to drive pricing down. Now, if we take that same perspective and apply it to where Galleria is located, where currently there isn't that much supply. You know, if you're looking to resell a, a condo unit, there's only 17 other units listed for sale right now. You know, comparing to over 400 at Jarvis and Church, there's only 1,700 units, avail uh, 17 units available for sale right now. And if you're looking to rent your unit, there are only 20 lease listings currently, as opposed to 1,700 somewhere else. So if you're buying today, it's a no-brainer right? But again, if you're going to have that foresight, and it's going back to that discussion where skate where the puck is, not where the puck is going. If you have that foresight, you're saying, okay, wait a second. I know that that area, you know, the downtown core, the central core is, is very saturated. There's still thousands of units that are scheduled to be delivered there every year for the next six, seven years. Or I could buy at Galleria where I could be five to 10 minutes away from the core. I could be on transit. I am still in downtown Toronto, just not the core. Um, I could buy for two to $300 less per square foot. And when it comes time to occupy it, I actually have almost no competition, which means I could charge a premium for my rentals or my assignment or my flip, or just, you know, I've built so much more equity in, in my property. And I really want to, if there's one thing that I want people to take away is, you know, the young and blur, the young and, you know, the young and, you know, whatever it is, they're like along the core. Sure, that makes sense if, you're, if your strategy is capital pr preservation. But, but if, you're, if your objective is capital appreciation and building your wealth, as is preached so often, you know, by, by Alex and Kyle, if you're looking really to build your wealth, this is one of the best calculated risks you can take. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's really a no-brainer. And then with the infrastructure you have going in there. So it's right. not a one-off building. You have the full com the uh, 95,000 square foot community center, uh, which will have childcare in it, very important. You, you have the nearly eight acre park going in. You have what makes a community in this location. It's gonna be a destination that people are going to want to live in. And when I talk about the demographic of the people that are going to live in there, it's going to be people that want to live in Toronto, but don't want to live in downtown anymore. It's probably going to be skewing 25 plus 25, 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds are all going to want to live in this area. You're not going to have the 21 year olds, the party years living, living in this area. It's going to be a really great family community feel. You know, you'll have your 30 year olds that still like to go out to nice restaurants because you have a great restaurants restaurant scene uh um bluer dale at bluer and dufferin some great restaurants uh you have geary which which is which is the cool strip right, right north of here and we've always looped back in when kyle and i bought our first condos we bought at uh queen and gladstone and when we bought in 2012 queen and gladstone wasn't what it is today you know it, it was very similar looking to to that bluer line where where your storefronts were, were sketchy. You know, there, there were some interesting, well, there's still interesting people on the street at, uh, along Queen, but, but you gotta look past that. You gotta look at the, 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 the new retail that's going in. You know, uh, it just popped in my head talking about the new retail going in. You know, what, what is that, cin there's a cinema that just recently was, was just opened up this year. And, and it, a very wealthy person had opened up. It's more of a legacy building for him. So there was a, there was a, a cinema that, that he fully gutted, renovated old school cinema wise and turned it into a restaurant theater venue. Now, when you have these multi-million dollar reno, renovation um, anchor, neighborhood anchor retail components coming in, that's when you know, wait, multi-millionaires. So we have the, say the, the billionaires come in 
Now we have, which are buying up the development sites. We've had the multimillionaires, which are taking the retail to, to invest in to, for the incoming, incoming population growth that's coming into the area because those multi-million dollar investors, they're like, well, if I wait for all the people to come, the prices are going to be through the roof. I, I, it doesn't make financial sense for me to do that. You're seeing that retail landscape change. That's where you got to look, as, as Ryan said, look what's, look what's happening in, in the future. Now, you know, because I have Ryan here and I know we've talked about, uh, well, developer prices aren't going down. They're only going to go up. Ryan, can you preach to the audience why developer prices are going up and, and, and why their cost base is it's not just going up a little bit, it's going up significantly. Yeah, so, so it, it's something that's really, really interesting to consider. When, when you're close to developers as we are, and you know, I, I speak to developers quite often, uh, regularly really, uh, this is one of the biggest things that comes up. Right now, when a developer in Toronto is looking at, uh, at a potential land acquisition, if they don't think that they can sell it for at least $850 per foot to $900 per foot, they won't even acquire that asset. And I'm only talking about Toronto's core, right? Like I'm not talking about the GTA. I'm not talking about Vaughn or Oakville or in Toronto, developers won't even look at a land acquisition opportunity unless they feel that they could sell for around $900 a foot because their cost base now is so high. The land acquisition costs are incredibly you know, high. Wait, wait, wait. You, you, mean, you mean higher than 900 per foot? higher than well the land acquisition costs aren't higher than 900 per foot but 900 is that point where a developer kind of breaks even and anything okay, yeah. beyond that is where they could see a profit right mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. people think that land development is is uh is is such a lucrative business and actually in the last um in the last few years, we've actually seen developer margins drop by 45%. So the profit margins have been dropping. So developers have actually been developing for less in profits than they have uh, earlier uh, in, in the last decade, because the cost of constructions are going at a, are increasing at a rate of 12 to 15% per year, which is incredibly high. Our, just in the last 15 years, our development charges in the city went up by, you'd never guess it if I tell you, you'd think it's fabricated. They went up by 3,200% in the last 15 years. Since 2005, development charges have increased in the city by three, the exact number is 3,244%. Wow. Right? That is insane. And the developers are on the hook for it because buyers are usually buyers that buy pre-construction. And I know you guys are incredibly savvy you get those development charge caps. So your buyer may, may pay $10,000 out of a, a $50,000 development charge bill. Guess who pays the other 40, yep. right? So the development charges, you know, all the different fees, the time that it takes to get a property zoned is incredibly long. So developers have to account to carry land uh, without revenue often. Well, uh, you, you, you know what, I'll jump in there because I know you were involved in, intimately in the gallery site for a very long time. Yeah. When was that land first purchased? The land was purchased, I, I think it was 2014 or early 2015. Um, it, was, it was put together and, and believe it or not, it's, it's actually been on the market kind of under the radar, but, but developers knew about that opportunity for, for a few years and no one wanted to touch that because there was some risk associated to it. You didn't know exactly uh, how the community will react. You didn't know exactly how long it's going to take for the city to approve. You didn't know what kind of density you're going to get, a, get a, uh, approved. And so, you know, looking back now, you obviously know uh, it's a no-brainer, but at that time, it's, the, the deal was actually kind of doing the rounds in the market for a while and, and developers looked at it, but many of them, again, it goes down to foresight. Many of them just thought like Dufferin and, and DuPont just doesn't make sense. Um, would you, would you attribute it to, I always look at Toronto like this, like Manhattanization, you know, you get density bills in certain pockets and, you know, at some point there's only a way to build up and, you know, 
we have different pockets in New York, Upper East, Chelsea, Iron, this, that. And then you look at Toronto and you got Annex and Bloor, you got downtown, you got Leslieville, you got, like, aren't we headed in the same direction that at some point it's just going to keep spreading that circle of downtown and we're going to keep going up. So isn't that what drives some of the, the growth? Yeah, the, the core will definitely continue to expand, but, but to, to circle back is land acquisition opportunities now. It's a very, very competitive market. And in a competitive market, developers pay for good land. Developer, developers pay a lot for it, right? Because that's what what's land in Toronto is worth. And, and that ties directly to the end price because if a developer buys land today for $200 per square, per buildable square foot, uh, if, they, if they bought land three years ago for 150, obviously today they have to sell the land for more money because they've paid more for it. And they will, that will continue to be the trend because land is increasingly more expensive because to your point, Amit, it's increasingly more scarce. And the less supply you have of land, the more you end up paying for it. And that just loops directly into the purchase price. So when people are saying, oh, developers, even, even now, well, I hear it less now, but in the first months of COVID, I, I've heard it a lot. Like in, in the end of March and April and May, in June, we started to see market confidence shift um, for the better. But in those three months, I've, I've heard a lot of people come up to me and say, you know what? I think, I think developers are going to start like, you know, dropping prices now and going on crazy incentives and it's going to be 50,000 off units and this is going to be the best time to buy. And I looked at people and I, say, and I said, that's going to be near impossible because the developer has all of their costs already locked in and they cannot afford to lower prices beyond a certain point. A developer would almost prefer to wait an extra six months for the market to recover and sell later than sell at a discount uh, on a fire sale because that literally is money out of their bottom line. And if they don't hit a certain profit margin, they actually won't even be able to finance the project uh, in many cases. You know what? You, you just brought up a great point. And, and you know what? If a builder does go too aggressively and they're not able to finance the project, the builder will go bankrupt. And even though you sign that contract for that incredible deal, you'll never get the unit at that price. And we saw it this year. We saw it Literally this year, a major developer, Crestford, three sites wiped out. One one site was almost done. One site. This 2, is units. Like, this is the uh, the Clover. The Clover site was almost done. Gone. Gone. All, all those contracts canceled. Clover, Halo. Um, Wasn't there Urban Corp years ago? Similar situation. Ur 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 Urban Corp, the same. Um, um, 33 Yorkville, the, the, these three sites gone. The Clover project, again, people were, were going to be getting occupancy. I think it was in about a year. <laughs> the, the building was getting glass on it. Done. Contracts canceled. Concord Pacific came in. I know it took two of, two of the sites. You know, contracts are canceled. Unit, units will be resold at a higher price. So as Ryan said, you know, people going, oh yeah, I'm going to get the discounts. <laughs> the discounts are too low. Guess what? No, no, no building for you. It, it, it's it just... Yeah. What you want is you tied up your, your capital for uh, four years, let's say, and then you get nothing. You get no, you get no return. You get the money back. That's what but, but developers also, Alex, they, they've – most of the developers in Toronto – Toronto is an incredibly sophisticated mm – -hmm. uh, has an incredibly sophisticated pool of real estate developers, truly. Like, we are the number one high-rise market in North America yep. for a reason. There's a lot of creativity – uh, there's a lot of out of the box thinking developers in Toronto are incredibly talented. And I, I'm actually, I feel so fortunate to, to know many of them personally and work with some of them on a, on a regular basis. Um, you know, like a lad for gallery, I speak to them almost daily and, and the amount of thinking they put into a site is unbelievable. They try to think of everything and um, you know, I don't think anyone would claim that they thought of everything, but, but they really go out of their way to, to think, to try and think of it all. And so many of these developers in Toronto have been through that last cycle in 2008, 2009, where we saw the market kind of go on a, on a freeze for a few months. And what happened in, in, that, um, in that economic crisis of, of 2008, 
that was the first time many of the developers in Toronto faced an, an economic crisis of that magnitude. And what they've done is they've reacted in the way that we just spoke about. You, you, you started seeing deals at $50,000 below ask, $40,000 below ask, you know, 5% down on units that will be ready in three years. Like you've started seeing crazy deals. Uh, we've seen some projects get canceled because of, because of that stuff, but a lot of developers reacted to the, to the market that way in September, October of 2008, November of 2008, January, February of 2009. And in March, the market just started to take off, right? In March, consumer confidence changed. The markets changed. People realized, you know what? Canada hasn't been affected in, that, in, in the same way that the U.S. has. There's a lot of more, there was a lot more security. There was a lot more governance, a lot more fiscal responsibility. And our market just started really taking off. And developers that were doing a fire sale literally one to four months before were just holding their head in disbelief, not, 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 uh, not grasping how the market reacted and turned positively so quickly, right? And so developers now, because they've been through that in 2008, they don't, they're not reacting to the, the slowdown in the market in the same panicked manner. They're way more calculated and way more patient and way more bullish about the market. And they understand that this is a blip on our radar and they're not gonna start going and saying, you know, $50,000 off units here, $40,000 off units there. They're not gonna do that. They're gonna, for the most part, they're gonna say, you know what? It may take me an extra six months to sell, but I'd rather stay true to my pricing. Yeah, and, 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 and they read the head, like they know there's, there's immigration to, that are gonna be hitting the 400,000 levels. They know Canada is gonna be one of the most attractive places in the world to- yeah. To, to, relo- to relocate in, in the future. The they, know, they know that the vaccine, you know, vaccine is coming and the efficacy has proven to be high. And you know, even before the vaccine arrives, the, the result of consumer confidence boost as a result of knowing that the vaccine is coming is sometimes enough to, to turn the momentum around. So developers are being patient this time for good reason. And as buyers, this is actually the best time to buy because even though prices may not be necessarily lower, terms may be beneficial. Yes, correct. Right? And we've, 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 we've preached that in regards to the, the, the capital side, the capital outlay you're able to make now. You know, pre-pandemic, you know, certain developments, you're getting up to 25% down um, to invest, to invest in the project. Now you, you have uh, 15% deposit structures, uh, over an extended period while, a period where you're getting in calendar 2020, 2021, 2022. As, as things turn, the builders take those off the plate. Gone. gone. The, build, the builders react to a positive market very fast. Very fast. <laughs> I, could tell you, I could tell you an experience. The builders react really fast because, uh, because what they do is as soon as they start seeing some positive momentum, they call someone like me who manages their sale and they say, Ryan, Take the 15% down structure off, make it back to 20. Instead of stretching it over two years, you know, put it into one year. Uh, our price right now averages X amount of dollars per square foot. We need you to raise that by 30 or $40 per square foot. It literally all, all happens on a single phone call. Yeah. That all yeah. happens on one phone call, mm-hmm. right? Wow. And you're sitting there just nodding saying, yeah, I can't argue with you because I see that the front, like I'm, I'm at the front line of the market and I'm seeing that confidence come back and I'm seeing more volume of interest and I'm seeing higher conversion rates on our sales floor and I'm seeing all of the data to support everything that you're telling me to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm of the philosophy that, that if we can find a way, just like every agent out there that represents a seller, if you can find a way to make more money for your client, then you want to do that. You're in, you're in that business. You're trying to find your clients the right opportunity so they can make more money. If you're representing a seller, you're trying to get the most money for their property. We're representing developers. Our job is to really do the same thing. We have to, of course, account for the fact that we have to hit certain milestones for the projects to get financed. And all of that is taken into consideration. But at the end of the day, our job is to create more value for developers. And so when they call us and they say, we need prices higher, we need terms go back to to normal, um, we, we have to apply those. And so right now, you know, a project like Galleria that we saw last year, that's a sellout in a weekend kind of project. 
right? Yeah. We, we, we've all lived the first two buildings last year. It happened in an instant. The amount of interest was incredibly high. You know, deposit structure was, was different. Promotions were different. Now you can walk into a site like Galleria 3. Um, you know, on our next release, our, our current release is nearly sold out, but our next release is coming in January 2021. You'll be able to come in as, as, a, as a platinum access realtor, Alex. Uh, you could bring in a client. Your client can pick a unit that they love, put down only 15% on it that stretched over, you know, a year and a half period. And then you forget about it for another four years after that. Alex, you're putting, if you're buying a $700,000 unit, all you're putting down is $105,000 spread out over a year and a half. And then you forget about it for another four years after that, because occupancy is five, five and a half years from now. I mean, how, how incredible is that? You're buying real estate at today's value, but you actually don't take possession of it. You don't take any of the, um, any of the accountability. You don't have to worry about a tenant or paying your mortgage or paying property taxes or anything for another five, five and a half years. I've done it 15 the best times. Best investment vehicles in the city, in my I've opinion. Done it, I've done it many times myself. Yeah, and, 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 and I was actually just jumping on my phone because I, I had the, the, the caption for this, this video and I had, to, I had to get that out. And really what it is, it's an invest like a REIT, over $2 billion worth of real estate development, in, development happening in Central West. And that, that's ultimately what it is. And there's only one place to, to actually invest the money. The other, the other places are already tied up by pension funds. So yeah. you know, you know, I, I, th I think we'll leave it off there you know, we're coming up the top of the hour. Um, but, uh, you know, Kyle and I have both invested in Galleria. We have a number of videos on it. The opportunity- So have I. Now, Ryan, Ryan has- personally invested in the first building and in the third building. Yeah, right, right. And I know a number of uh, agents bought in the third building as well. Yeah, we um, have a few that bought like across every phrase. Yeah, so so we're telling you, you know, we've, we're, we're honest people. We're telling you where the where the opportunity is. And your, your opportunity won't last long. So Ryan, thank you so much for coming on, giving us some, pulling the curtain back to show us some okay. of what, how a, a builder looks at things and what's going to be happening. Um, again, everyone, um, Amit's here for getting you the financing when these buildings are completing or getting the refinancing to pull out the capital um, so that you can invest in these pre-construction uh, projects. That's, that's how you build and grow. You leverage your current assets to grow the portfolio. Uh, and uh, as always, Kyle and Alex here to, uh, to help you with your uh, uh, condo advice. Okay, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking Thank me. you. Thank Pleasure. You. Uh, Take we'll care, talk to everyone, everyone later. Bye. 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 Bye.